so that's the young missionaries you would see at Temple Square or that are coming to your door have been through the washing and anointing. They've been through the endowment part. They've been through the curtain and into this celestial room that's like a big um, hotel lobby or something, very plush, ornate sort of room that's supposed to represent having come into God's presence. Then you would go back to your locker room to change into your street clothes, keeping the underwear on that they gave you. And for the woman, that means her bra goes over this. Uh, the temple garment is to be the closest to your skin. Same for a man. If you, a man wants briefs on, he's got to wear them over his temple garment. Nothing goes under the garment. It has to be the closest to your skin. So if you get married that day, you go from the celestial room? Uh, then to the uh, ceiling room. Now, in today's world, usually they will go through the endowment ceremony before the day of the wedding just so they aren't at the temple for a long period of time and they aren't so worn out. I mean, in the old days, you did the whole thing in one stretch. But today, for instance, if a girl's marrying a guy that's been on a mission, he doesn't need to go take out his endowments again. He's already been through that part. She might go, like, on Wednesday and take out her endowments, and then the two of them meet at the temple Friday night or Saturday morning or something for the marriage ceremony itself. Gotcha. If they did it all in one day, they would come out of the celestial room, they would go down the hall to a ceiling room. And a ceiling room well, might be 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 or something, they have different sizes. And there would be chairs around the outer edge of the room. And depending on the size of the room, how many chairs you're going to have. And so if you have temple-worthy family they, or friends, they could come and watch your marriage, um, but they have to have a temple recommend to get in the building. But you can only have as many as that room will seat. And so it limits how many can go, which causes problems in a lot of big Mormon families. Because if very many of your family are qualified to go to the temple, you may run out of seats, and not everyone that wanted to come to your wedding may be able to come and watch yeah, it. They can choose. So you have to decide who's coming. Well, does Aunt Hilda come, or do I leave out my sister that I don't like? Or, uh, you know. So it gets kind of dicey on how you divvy out your tickets. Um, in some families, they don't. It, maybe the rest of their family aren't Mormon or something, and so then it's not a problem having enough seating for the people that could come see you get married. But it's limited on the seating of how many could watch this. When, when you have your sealing ceremony, the bride and groom are in their temple clothing, and they will kneel at a velvet-covered altar in the middle of the room uh, on each side facing each other, and then... Uh, across the altar, they will uh, uh, clasp hands in the sure sign of the nail hand hold, and the uh, fellow that's officiating, a temple worker or whoever is going to marry them, would be there and say the marriage ceremony, which is, he may say a few words of encouragement or something first, but the ceremony itself is pretty short that uh, by the power of the priesthood and whatever, you know, that he's sealing them for time and all eternity. And then they kiss over the altar, but they don't exchange rings. The ex exchange of rings is something Subsequent. they could just walk outside and give each other rings, uh, or they could do it at the reception. And so some opt for some sort of ring ceremony at a reception when they do that. Um, but is it done in the temple? So for the marriage... Uh, the people that came to see you get married don't necessarily have to dress in their temple clothing to see you get married. They can come in just their Sunday clothing really? to watch this. Uh, but with, the girl, with their garments on, but, with, but they're always wearing the uh, garments. Black, but uh, but they could just have on a suit or a uh, flower dress or whatever. Now the girl can request a white wedding. And if you request a white wedding, that means everyone has to dress in their white clothing for the, the ritual. So it's a matter of choice how you do it. Um, but they're in their white clothing, their temple clothing for this. So there's, there's mirrors on the wall? Uh, yeah, the temple ceiling rooms are usually set up to way where they have all these mirrors at the two ends of the room so that when they're kneeling at the altar, they're looking at a mirror behind the other person that reflects their image back and back and back and back. And this is to represent that your life 
is one eternal uh, affair, and it, and it goes on forever, and no beginning and no end. So it's a reflective way they have the mirrors done uh, to get that kind of feeling across to them. Um, when, when they get through with the temple ritual, a lot of them go outside and have their pictures taken. But when you see a Mormon wedding picture, the wedding picture is not what they looked like when they got married. Because when they got married, they were wearing the Mormon temple ritual outfits. And when they get their temple pictures taken in front of the temple, now they're all dressed up for the reception. So uh, when, when they get dressed to go outside, the guy then is going to wear the stuff he's going to wear for the reception. So for his wedding picture, he may be standing in front of the Salt Lake Temple in a tuxedo, black tuxedo. Okay, so when, they, when they're having their picture taken in front of the temple, uh, they're in the clothes they'll wear to the reception. So the guy's in his tuxedo, and it could be black, blue, whatever color he's chosen to wear. Uh, but that's not what he was wearing in the temple ritual. And the girl's going to have on this beautiful wedding gown. Now, if she wore it in the temple, which she could, depending on its style, when she wore it in the temple, it would have had no um, underskirt to hold the skirt out if it was a fuller one or whatever. And, but over, it, over her wedding dress, she would have had this sheet for the priesthood thing on it and the sash and the green apron and not the veil she's going to wear at her reception, this little square of veil material that she'll have on, that she wore when she went, got married. Now she's got on this beautiful dress with all her frilly undercoat uh, holding it out pretty and she's got a beautiful veil that her folks probably paid $2,000 for or something. And that she didn't wear for a wedding. And so she, and, uh, she may have high heels on or something. So the, the whole, the Mormon wedding picture is deceptive because it gives you the impression when you see that on the mantle of some Mormon's house, you think, oh, that's what they look like when they got married. No, it isn't. They were in these funny outfits. The guy had on this funny baker's hat. She had on this funny little veil. Uh, and these robes and sheet things and, and ties and all. So it was very different than what they have in their, on their mantle as their wedding picture. So at their reception, you are looking at stuff they have put on special for a reception. So the folks have paid $5,000 or whatever, some fantastic gown that she wore. And when she went through the temple ritual, she had all this other stuff over it. Right. Now the ceremony itself, the ceiling ceremony, very priesthood oriented? Is it? Yeah, it's said by the power of the Melchizedek priesthood and they're having the patriarchal Melchizedek priesthood grip uh, and, and he says by power of the authority of the state of Utah or whatever, you know, he pronounces them man and wife um, and the witnesses there would sign a, a marriage certificate on all, but it's all very besides the literal part you say to get your uh, legal marriage uh, he would have a thing he'd say about the priest, uh, Melchizedek priest, at sealing power. So a typical adult person who's attending the temple, they're not usually doing baptisms, baptisms for the dead. They're usually going through the endowment and proxy sealings. Yes. So a, a, an adult Mormon could go and do baptisms for the dead, but they don't usually. Usually the young teenagers do baptism for the dead. Uh, it's the one thing a teenager can do before they've taken out their endowment, so they usually leave that for them. Uh, so for the adult person going to the temple, the first time they go through the ritual, they would go through the washing and anointings, the endowment, and the veil into the celestial kingdom, uh, and depending on whether they've been married yet, uh, off into a ceiling room for the marriage ceremony. But when they go back to do work for the dead, they can take the option of going through the washing and anointing ceremony for a dead person or six or 12 or whatever people and just do a bunch of them right in a row of the handshakes and washing and anointing stuff. Or they can do the endowment part where they sit in the big room and watch the movie and on learn behalf of another. on the behalf of a dead person uh, and the going through the veil part or they could opt to do the sealing marriage ceremony for dead people. So they have now, the church has now broke the temple ritual up into three parts. Well, actually four parts if you count the baptismal part. 
So one person has to have each of these four parts done for them. Baptism, washing, anointing, endowment, and sealing. But you as a temple worker could go Friday night and opt to just do one of those segments for a dead person. And so this gets kind of crazy because you'll have them go through and maybe somebody shows up and says, okay, I want to do five ceilings. I got time for five ceilings. And so you'd go through five marriage ceremonies for five people. Now, those five names don't necessarily have all the other rituals done for them yet. So they, they don't have to be done in order. So they might, they might have their ceilings done before they even have the washing and anointing. Yeah, stuff. right. So, I mean, that's... So there's proxy <laughs> baptism. Proxy washing and anointings, proxy endowments, yeah. and then proxy sealings. Sealing, yeah. Wow. So they have to do each of those parts. And so you could go Saturday morning and say, I have time to do 10 washing and anointing ceremonies for people, but I don't have time to go through the whole endowment ceremony. So they'll just do a few of the washing and anointing ceremonies for you, and they'll get 10 names that have been turned in. Uh, and if you go to the temple to do an endowment ceremony, you're usually only going to do one or two because of the length of the ceremony. I mean, you could stay for a couple of them. Or I don't know if you could fit in three in a day. But um, so it, you can do for more people if you do one of the other shorter ceremonies and if you do the endowment. So a lot of people will just opt, though, to just go like Friday night. We'll just go and do endowment. And then you can just sit and, and go through this endowment ceremony and watch this movie, uh, and I suspect some of the old people sleep through it. Uh, my, my grandpa uh, did temple work as an old person. He was in a rest home, or an old po folks home, Mormon retirement home, up by the temple here in Salt Lake. And so he'd walk a block over to the temple every day and go through the endowment ceremony for people. And I suspect he probably slept through most of them. But just, you gotta have a body there to go through all these rituals all the time. Um, it's not entirely directly related to the flow of thought here, but the, the names they're giving, yeah. the, these special temple names, it seems like Mormons feel like the special name they're given is a very unique, even prophetic, revelatory name. But you yeah. learn later that there really was just one name chosen for a that big day. group of people that day. Yeah, right. Everybody with you, if you're getting your name that day, yes. got the same name. Right. When you ha go through the Washington anointing, they whisper to you your new name for all eternity, which may be for a woman, Mary, Elizabeth, or uh, Rebecca, or something, Bible, Book of Mormon name. Um, it doesn't have to be a biblical or Mormon scripture name. It can be some other European name. I've heard some people being uh, given other names outside of scriptural names. Um, and then for the men, you would usually get, you know, Peter or, or uh, Jeremiah or Ezekiel or, you know, whatever. Or uh, you could get Nephi or Lehi or whatever. Uh, and so, but everyone in that session would have got the same name, but it's whispered to them. And so whether you are aware of it or not, everybody that session got the same name. Now, when you go through the ritual, the woman tells her husband her new name. He does not tell her his new name. Ever? No, never. Not supposed to anyway. He's, he is not supposed to ever tell her, anyone, his new name. She tells him her name because uh, they don't make this clear in the ritual today, but in the past, it was very plainly taught. The man needed to know her name because he was going to call her up in the resurrection to be his wife. So he's going to say, Elizabeth, come forth. And if he doesn't call her up, she wouldn't resurrect to be his wife. It doesn't mean she wouldn't resurrect, but she wouldn't resurrect to be his wife. He has to call her up. Well, she has no need to know his name because that has nothing to do with resurrecting him. And um, we had a situation uh, a couple of years ago when I had two Mormon people sitting here that had, were fairly fresh out of Mormonism who were talking to me. And while we were talking, a Christian couple came in. And we all got talking, and uh, this Christian couple was so excited to hear these people were coming out. We got talking about the temple ritual. And so the Christian guy asked the Mormon lady, so what was your new name? And she says Elizabeth or whatever it was, and just tells him, you know. 
And so he says then to the Mormon man, and what was your new name? And he just got white. He just sat there with this, you know, uh, deer in the headlight kind of look on his face. And the Mormon wife turns to her husband and she says, yeah, what is your new name? I never knew it even. And he's sitting there in this kind of panic mode because this is the moment of uh, decision. Am I really sure Mormonism is not true? Because I better not say that name if I have any doubt that Mormonism could be true. I, I'm doing the ultimate violation of my temple covenant. And so he sat there for a minute trying to weigh that one out. And finally he stumbled and said, and I don't remember what it was, but like saying, you know, it's Ezekiel or something. And, but this was a major moment. I mean, it was that important, that intense, that he sat there with the fear of God trying to decide, am I really sure Mormonism isn't true? Because if I say this, I'm in big trouble if I say this and, and it's true. So I believe it was a very freeing experience for him to say that, to break that covenant. Now Mormons will say to me, oh, it's terrible to talk about these things and he shouldn't have said that and, and you know, and they, they really get upset about discussing all of this. And, it, and they'll bring up, well, if a person took an oath to God never to reveal that, they should never reveal that. And my point to them is, it was not an oath God inflicted. It was not an oath that the God of the Bible asked them to make. This is not a biblical experience that they are violating. To a false God. This is a false ceremony to a false God given by a false prophet. And, just, and I put to the Mormon when they bring up this objection to me, if you had someone that had gone through a witchcraft ritual or a satanic ritual where they had taken an oath to Satan, would you feel they were bound to that and could never renounce that or talk about it if they left it to become a Mormon? I mean, you wouldn't hold them accountable for that oath they took in that false yeah. experience. And I don't think people realize just how serious this is for ex-Mormon mature Christians because they're still struggling with I made these promises, yes. these covenants, and they feel bad. Yeah. And it's a process they have to work through. Yes, because it didn't come from God. And so I make the illustration to a Mormon. It's just like truth in lending laws that we have now. When you go in to get a loan at the bank, we have laws that say they must give you truth in lending. They have to lay out the contract and explain the terms before you sign. Yeah. You don't get that in the Mormon temple ritual. You aren't told ahead of time what all these oaths and covenants are going to be. You don't have to kind to contemplate this. The temple preparatory classes they have never tell you these things. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. No. You don't know what covenants you're going to no. make. You don't you know about the handshakes. The you don't know about the promises, the covenants, nothing. And so you were asked to sign a contract that was blank, and they are later going to fill in the conditions. And so I do not believe it's a binding contract because you were not given foreknowledge of what you were going to be asked to do and it was not disclosed to you this was an invention of Joseph Smith and that this is not biblical, it isn't even in the Book of Mormon. So I don't see it as having a binding quality on a Mormon's life. It, for a Christian, anything relating to our belief in eternal life is open for discussion. I, I hold it all sacred. I hold communion as sacred, but anyone could come into the church I go to and watch the communion service. There is nothing in our service or communion that the pastor wouldn't be happy to sit down and explain to you, to give you the wording, let you read it, talk about it all. There is nothing uh, hidden from you beforehand. It's full disclosure on, on anything you want to ask beforehand, and yet that's not the case in Mormonism. There is no disclosure ahead of time. Wow. You go in blindly into a service, you have no idea what's coming. And it's totally different than a regular Mormon service. So nothing prepares you for this. They don't wear special clothing in their church services. They don't have a special ritual. I mean, the closest you get to any kind of special ritual is when they, uh, every week they have, uh, they call it sacrament, but communion service. And they have a ritual of the prayer they say, and they have to say it word perfect. And they have their ordination to priesthood where they would put hands on your head and say a specific prayer for ordination. But those are the rituals you see, but there's nothing, uh, I mean, you, you could see something similar to that in many different Christian churches. But the temple ritual itself is totally separate. You, know, you don't know ahead of time what's coming. Sandra, could you talk a little bit about the Kirtland Temple? 
and what it was like and what they did there. Okay, the Mormons were in Kirtland in the mid-1830s, and they built a temple, but it was designed differently than the temples they make today. And the main floor <clears throat> of the temple was a big flat area where you could set out chairs, but you could uh, orient them to either end of the building. But at both ends of the building were these platforms, and one end was for the Aaronic priesthood, and the other end was for the Melchizedek priesthood. And so, but they just had uh, open meetings in this, or they could have a priesthood meeting in it, but it wasn't the closed edifice like they have now, and they didn't use it for the kind of rituals they have now. But they called it a temple. <clears throat> they called it a temple, but uh, that time period, I think you would have found a number of Christians that would have built buildings that they either called a tabernacle or a temple, as well as a chapel so or a church. So it kind of functioned like the tabernacle functions today. The <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so it would be kind of like the idea of the Mormon tabernacle today on Temple Square where they just hold big meetings. Um, when they first um, dedicated the Kirtland Temple, they were supposed to have, Joseph had promised a big endowment ceremony, a big special experience with God uh, that was going to happen at the dedication. And when you say endowment, Today, we think all sorts of things about it, but back then in Kirtland, what would they have? It, it would have just been a special meeting with God to get special information, and that they were going to somehow have an experience with God at this dedication service. And so they were told to fast uh, for the day before they went to the temple. And then when they, the men all met there that uh, evening, they had uh, c uh, communion or sacrament, but at that time the Mormons were using wine. Nowadays they just use water, but back then they were using wine. And evidently wine was freely served in the building, so that um, from different accounts we gather that people were getting drunk, and they stayed all night. Um, there are different people that talk about the vision experiences that happened in the Kirtland Temple, uh, but one of the Book of Mormon witnesses, David Whitmer, said there were no visions. Jesus didn't show up like some people claimed. He said it was just these people that had been over drinking. They would, ha in a drunken stupor, think something happened. Uh, tired. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're tired and hungry and over drinking on their wine. And so uh, it gave this illusion to people that something miraculous had happened. But Whitmer said nothing happened at the temple. Uh, but you have in the folklore of Mormonism a lot of stories that uh, there were different encounters with heavenly beings and that Jesus showed up. So um, I read somewhere that it was kind of like a, a Pentecostal service that they had there. It was <clears throat> they had much more of an emphasis on speaking in tongues and angelic visitations and this whole idea of going to the temple back then, to the Kirtland Temple. What was that like? Well, yes, it would have been more of like a uh, Pentecostal revival today uh, where they would go and expect some big outpouring. In the Kirtland period and even in the early Nauvoo period, uh, different Mormons were claiming to speak in tongues. Now that dropped out of use here in Utah and by the 1900s, Mormons weren't claiming to speak in tongues, but um, if you had visited Kirtland in the mid-1830s, evidently a lot of the service would, would have seemed more like a Pentecostal church service today, where you would have seen people speaking in tongues and uh, um, having some sort of holy excitement and uh, you know the waving of arms and you know just much more exuberance and, and stuff happening in the service. Today, a Mormon service is a pretty staid quiet affair, but the Kirtland period of Mormonism was much more demonstrative in their services. Foot washings? Uh, they did foot washings in the Kirtland Temple, and um, they. Th this was not uncommon in other groups as well. I mean, the Brethren group uh, still today do foot washing, and some church services do that. Just as a symbol of uh, a symbol, A symbol of uh, humility and service to one another. Uh, so in Kirtland, they had a foot washing ceremony. Um, 
there's nothing wrong with the basic concept, but it's just that it was the beginning of Joseph developing ritual in Mormonism. The 1830 experience of Mormonism would have been much more simple of just gathering together, having a few songs and a service, uh, but, you know, pretty simple kind of a thing. And so in Kirtland, you start developing a little more ritual, a little more form, um, a little more um, distinction between their services and what, what happened at everyone else's services. So there was a building this little more feeling of specialness, of uh, having something more than the outside world has at their services. A unique sacred space. A unique sacred space kind of idea, which becomes pronounced more as they get to Nauvoo, and Joseph introduces his temple ritual there, which is a much more elaborate system than what they would have had at Kirtland. Ceilings at Kirtland? Um, no, well, they, I don't know, not in the sense of ceiling as a Mormon would understand it today. It was more a matter of being sealed up to eternal life, whereas the Mormon going to the ceremonies now would be, uh, in a sense, sealed, I guess, to eternal life. But it more, it's more a matter of a sealing of families where your man and wife are sealed together so they'll be a couple forever. And you're sealed to your parents and your children are sealed to you. So that there's this idea of sealing of generational families in a chain uh, that will always be connected in this sealed genealogy of form in the hereafter. Uh, but, it, but in Kirtland... It, was, it related to God. It didn't relate to you to other people. So the ritual of sealing in Kirtland was um, a kind of stamp of eternal security of, of yes. you're going, when you die, you will be, yeah. you'll be okay. You know, yes, a sealing to God. And in Nauvoo, years later, it developed more into a... It would have included that, but it also would have included this idea of being sealed to one another. So just for clarification, though, at the Kirtland Temple, there are no ceilings as we understand them today. No. No, um, no endowment. No. Uh, no uh, washings and anointings? No, the foot washing, but not the body washing and anointing. Not the anointing of the head with oil and blessings like they do in the temple today. No baptism for the dead. No baptism for the dead at that point. Okay. So um, just give us a good survey now of the evolution of the temple from Kirtland on. I mean, we have this Kirtland temple. It looks nothing like they are today. How did we get to where we are today? Well... You have Joseph Smith start going into polygamy at this time period, which he has to keep secret because it's against the law. And when he goes to Nauvoo, Illinois, and sets up his community there, Illinois had laws against bigamy. So for him to more and more be going into polygamy, taking other wives, he is running a risk more and more of being found out and someone talking about this. So I believe he's trying to think of, find a way to bind his leadership together in a form of secret ordinance to where they are bound to one another to keep their knowledge of their inner workings private within that group. And this is a way of protecting himself on the few that are aware of his marrying these different women. Um, I mean, he's not even telling his wife about this. You know, I mean, those are real secrets. <laughs> so uh, those that are aware that something like this is going on, what are you going to do is trying to explain to them why you're uh, reaching out to these different women. So then he starts to develop this idea of well, this is part of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, uh, Abraham's seed would be eternal, endless. And so uh, God has promised us that we can be sealed and have endless posterity. And this is all part of the plan. And I'm restoring uh, everything, even Old Testament things, as well as New Testaments. And we're going to restore uh, the ritual of the Old Testament. And part of the ritual of the Old Testament uh, is this temple ritual and this idea of fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant of, uh, uh, of this posterity that will go on forever. So he's 
so he's uh, telling these women that if they will be sealed to him, they will be sealed for eternity as his wives. This will guarantee their eternal place with God, and they will have this eternal family in the hereafter. He's going to the men, certain select friends, and saying, this way you'll be sealed to your wife forever, your kids will be sealed to you, and you will have this dynasty in the hereafter, and we are fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant by having posterity beyond number. So, uh, but we're not to tell this to the outside world, because they won't understand it, and the law would arrest us if they realized what we were doing. And so, I see the temple ceremony developing as a way of bringing others into what he's doing. It's a protection for him, I mean, from a crass outsider's point of view. It's a way of protecting himself. If others are involved in the same thing, they aren't gonna go spill the beans on you. And uh, um, also developing this doctrine of self-glorification, that you can have eternal life. You can become a god. You can have a planet. You can have Abraham's blessing of seed without number. You can have these planets and worlds and populate them. So it's all appealing to the nature of man for self-exaltation. So at first, his first plural wife he takes that we know of in Nauvoo in what was it, 1841, with a, a single woman by the name of Louisa Beeman. No, just to interrupt, uh, this is assuming that his relationship with Fanny Alger was an altogether of a different sort. Um, in the 18, mid 1830s, Joseph had been associated uh, with a woman, a young teenage girl named Fanny Alger. The question with Fanny is: Was she a plural marriage or was she an adulterous affair? And um, I think it looks like an adulterous affair. The Mormon Church has to list her as a plural wife because obviously their prophet couldn't have been having an adulterous affair. So if he was having an affair with Fanny, he must have been married to her. And even if it was seen under the rubric of polygamy, uh, the way that Smith had a framework for polygamy and ceilings and this whole connectivity, much more developed by Nauvoo. Yes, with Fanny, the question is in the 1830s, uh, was there a marriage ceremony of any kind, even of a Mormon ceremony? Uh, was there anything done to try to make this a uh, religious experience? There is a very late account of a man saying that there was a marriage ceremony, but it's so late an account that I don't know that it's credible. Uh, I think he was trying to save Joseph's reputation at that point, because the things we have at the time don't frame it that way. Oliver Cowdery, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, wrote to his brother Warren uh, just a couple of years after the Fanny Auger affair, and he said, I stood Joseph to the face about his dirty, nasty, filthy affair with Fanny Auger. So Oliver, one of the witnesses, he did not see this as a sacred experience, as a marriage, uh, or anything. Uh, Fanny only stays in the Smith home for a uh, short time after supposedly whatever ceremony, if you're gonna say a ceremony, uh, his togetherness with her. Uh, and then she leaves the home and finally ends up back at her parents. So uh, Louisa is the first clear. So Louisa home. is the first in Louisa in 1841 in Nauvoo is the first case of someone where there seems to be a clear historic contemporary account of a marriage ceremony being done. I mean, it's not legal. It's just something the Mormons are doing themselves outside of any connection with the law. But a Mormon guy, the brother of Louisa, meets Joseph and Louisa at the river's edge, and Louisa's even dressed as a man to disguise what's even going on. And uh, then the brother says this temple ritual of uh, sealing ceremony to, to marry them together. And, um, but then, uh, at that point, he hasn't developed his Masonic temple ritual thing. Um, I mean, there's just this ceiling. It's just this small little outside the temple. ceremony outside of the temple, out in the open, of sealing him to Louisa. Then um, he goes, uh, then in the next year, he goes through the Masonic lodge uh, ritual, and the Mormons set up a lodge in Nauvoo. I believe the reason the Mormons got involved in the lodge was uh, as a means of trying to buy uh, protection 
because they had had so many times when they'd been driven out of their homes and had run-ins with the local establishment that were worried about the Mormons coming in and taking over their community. Uh, I think Joseph realized that, okay, in, in most cities in the area, stuff was kind of, all the top leadership in any town seemed to be Masons. So if you could get the Masons on your side and join in with them, it kind of, probably kind of helped buy you some, uh, 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 yeah, some acceptance in the community. So all the Mormons become, all the men go into Masonry. And pretty soon the... Just ma mass. Mass, yeah, they got mass. Uh, the, the Mormons become the largest group of Masons in Illinois. Um, so they have their own lodge there. But then uh, Joseph Smith goes through the lodge, and like in two days, he's raised a master mason. Well, this is unheard of in masonry. This is, for most men, this takes years to work up to through the levels to this point. Joseph just, you know, does it in two days, or one day, whatever. I mean, it was really quick. So uh, that would be irregular. I mean, this was not the way the mason's ritual works. Uh, this becomes a precursor to his temple ritual. After he goes through the lodge and sees the, the, how the Masonic flow of the ritual is, he starts coming up with an idea for his ceremony. Now in the Masonic lodge, their ceremony centers around a story of a guy named Hiram Abiff who's supposed to be the architect for Solomon's temple. And um, uh, he gets killed, and with him, they lose the correct name of God. And so they're trying to raise Hiram on the five points of fellowship to get the true name of God. So that's behind the ritual. So the Freemasons are restorationists of their own sort. Yes, they were claiming to restore Solomon's temple ritual. And, and, and in this play, working out the way Solomon's temple was put together and how the, the, the temple received the true name of God for the ritual and that. Joseph goes through this and says, oh, well, you know, I could adopt, adapt this to my own ritual. So he comes up with a new ritual that is going to be a play. It's going to have a guy in charge and uh, the initiate comes in and there's going to be a sing-song dialogue back and forth, just like in masonry. The form of it is much similar to how the initiate comes into masonry and is questioned and he has to give answers and he's taught certain uh, words and things uh, to, to raise up through different levels. And so you have that in the Mormon ritual as he's setting this up. Uh, when he first brings other men into this endowment ceremony that he's gonna have for his temple ritual, he hasn't set up the whole idea yet of the of what it finally becomes. And um, the first uh, times of doing the Mormon ceremony, they uh, did some in the top level of his, he, Joseph had a brick store, and they did some of the ritual at first at the upper level of his brick store. Uh, the Mormons also had a Masonic lodge there in town, and I think they did some of the ritual at first there. Is there any like, masonry? Brick connection there. Yeah, I don't know. The, the, a lot of the buildings were brick in Nauvoo. Uh, and so they well, do it. Was, it was a house made of bricks. Made of bricks. Okay, okay. A, a brick storefront thing. Okay. Uh, and a, a general mercantile store. Okay, okay. And on the second floor was kind of like a warehouse open storage area upstairs. Okay, I've been there, yeah. And so up on the second floor, they were doing some of the original. Uh, uh, form of his temple ritual. Uh, but he told them at the time, well, I can't set the up, it's up and say exactly right, we need to build a temple to where we can lay everything out right, but this will have to do for the time being. And uh, so he starts formulating this idea of an inner circle. At first it's just men, but then he soon brings women into this. But this is a select group of men, and these are also the men he's going to be bringing into his uh, political kingdom of God idea, his polygamy. Well, it's some of those same people, but it's not literally the Council of 50 operating as such, but it would be some of those men. So it's top leadership are being brought in to these rituals. Um, so then he's, uh, they start building the Nauvoo temple, which he said he can't give them every, all the rituals and stuff till they get the Nauvoo temple built. And um, as it's coming along, 
they haven't got it finished before Joseph dies. And so he does some of the ceremony on the uh, top floor of the temple, but it's crudely set up. They don't have anything the way they uh, finally want it. But um, the, the basics have been hammered out. But in the Mormon ritual, as opposed to the Masonic one, which is based on the story of Hiram and Abiff and Solomon's temple, Joseph's temple now is going to evolve to become a, um, a story of the creation story. And it's all about how God creates the universe and the world, and then he forms man, and it's going to be a Garden of Eden play of the fall of Adam and Eve and the devil coming to tempt him, and then how Adam and Eve become restored back to God. And so it's a, a passion play of sorts. And you're going to take the journey of man from the creation through uh, coming to earth and his uh, learning what he needs to know about God, handshakes, passwords, and all these things as he travels through life and then to his death when he's going to be tested by God and the angels, whether he can enter into God's presence. And so that becomes the play. So it has a different form, a different storyline than the Masonic ritual. So at first blush, a person said, well, they aren't the same. How can you say Joseph used the Masonic ritual? Because it's not about Hiram Abiff. It's not about Solomon's Temple. No, but the form of the play is Masonic. It's clearly the sing-song dialogue, the specific words, um, the handshakes they're going to learn, and the passwords they're going to use. So the handshakes are almost exactly, they're going to take it almost exactly. Yeah. From, from masonry, yes. And so you got the handshakes, you have uh, certain phrases in the wording that is Masonic. Signs and tokens. And then they get the penalties, which are almost exactly from Masonry, that you are to swear to keep all these things secret. And uh, if you don't keep them secret, the penalty is to have my tongue ripped from my mouth and my heart to be pulled out of my bosom and my bowels to be gushed out. And it's very graphic in the original of how these oaths are given. And they're directly parallel to the Masons. If you laid out an expose of Masonry from Joseph Smith's time with the wording of Joseph's ceremony at the time, you would see the wording of the penalties is just the same. And so a lot of Mormons have argued for years, well, Masonry was a corrupt form of Old Testament temple ritual. Joseph brought in the restored form. The problem is, the Masonic ritual doesn't go back to Solomon's day. It only goes back into the uh, 13 to 1700s development in England. And the wording similarities are to the 1800 wording. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so it's obviously a current borrowing because it's that wording that is the so he's same. So he's not merely borrowing masonry, he's borrowing 19th century masonry. Yeah, okay. current for him, his current Masonic ritual is the same wording as he's ending up with for the penalties and oaths in his ceremony. Now, now the baker's hat, the, the, uh, the, the green apron, uh, the altar in the ceiling room, uh, the compass in the square, the all-seeing eye, these are all Masonic. Not the green apron, okay. the idea of an apron. But when the Joseph Smith first set up his temple ritual, it was a white muslin square apron with green fig leaves sewed on. And the Masons use a white apron, but they don't have green fig leaves sewed on. They're, now, there's different kind of Masonic aprons depending on what level of Mason you are, so they have different forms. But the initiate into Masonry would wear a white apron. So he has a white apron on him, but he sews on green fig leaf aprons. Now it's a solid green piece of material, but originally it was just white cloth that they sewed little leaves on. Uh, so now the story of the Mormon one is the creation story with Adam and Eve instead of Hiram Abiff. Uh, so the meaning, the goal of the ceremony is different. Uh, whereas Mormonism's goal in going through their temple ritual is to seal you up to eternal life. The Masonic one is just to teach you correct balance in your life in relation to God and man and that kind of thing. It doesn't have with it the same idea as the Mormons, where it's a, a ritual that seals you into this godhood track of progressing forever to godhood. So uh, 
the undergarment that the Mormons wear was first developed there in Nauvoo by Joseph Smith, and it was a one-piece thing, and it was a bulky uh, sort of uh, one-piece thing with ties in the front, like a, like a long john underwear, but it wasn't long john underwear. I mean, it was a special thing made just for this purpose, for this ceremony, and uh, then the outf white outfit that you'd wear over it. Um, Can I ask you about the yeah. endowment back then? Um, yeah. Do we really have a, a clear picture of... It, it seems like Smith thought of Jehovah as the father primarily, and it seems like the naming conventions for Elohim Jehovah, Adam Michael, for, were for Brigham of the Adam God structure, and then it seems like what we have today in Mormonism is James Talmadge, Talmadge's reconstruction of all that. What was... Smith's, uh, how did he how did he fit in the the key figures in the endowment circle? Okay, a Mormon today reads into um, a lot of quotes they would read and the experience in the temple ceremony. Today's Mormonism, uh, when Joseph Smith wrote out his well, not wrote, but developed his temple ritual. Elohim was not seen as God the Father. It wasn't this clear Father, Son, and Adam. Uh, you know, Elohim today in Mormonism would be seen as Heavenly Father that the Mormons pray to, and Jehovah would be seen as the Son, and Michael becomes Adam. But in, Brig in uh, Joseph's day, Elohim would have represented the council of gods, this higher form of of God's uh, or the head of the council, of God. He head of the council of God's, however you want to make it, Jehovah would have been Our Father. heavenly Father, and then uh, Michael, who becomes Adam. Now, when Brigham Young comes along, he wants to redefine. Well, I don't know if you say redefine it. He defines it differently. He says Joseph taught him his Adam God doctrine. Whether he did or not, it's hard to say. I mean, I think I can show some elements of how it could have been that Joseph brought it to him, but uh, Brigham's the one that clearly right. is the one that articulates the idea that Adam is our God, our Heavenly Father that we pray to. And so in, in Brigham's scheme, he seems to have this hierarchy of gods so that you have the head God up here and Jehovah becomes the God over our God, who is Michael. It's head of the great father. Yeah, it's like heaven, Jehovah becomes like a heavenly grandfather to Michael, our God. And in Brigham Young's doctrine, Michael at one time was a human on some other world system, has died and gone to heaven and earned his godhood, and is now coming to start his planet with his spirit children. And he comes back to be the form of a man in the Garden of Eden to start the human family, and then goes back to heaven to oversee it all. Yeah, so it's. Uh, um, so I, I get the distinct impression from reading the modern transcript of the, the endowment ceremony. Um, Satan tells Eve uh, of eating the forbidden fruit. This is the way the father gained his knowledge. It almost seems like uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but there are still today little vestige element leftovers of what was Brigham's Adam God uh, integration. But we'll get back to that. Sorry. But that would even fit in today's understanding, though, that God was once a man. Right. It's adaptable. Right? Yeah, adaptable either way. But So Brigham Young articulates uh, the Adam-God theory that our Heavenly Father was really Michael and that he was under the jurisdiction of Jehovah, who's under the jurisdiction of Elohim and the other gods in the universes, whatever is out there. So it's a whole pantheon of gods out there. So uh, it, is, it isn't um, a clear-cut thing like a Mormon would think today that when you read old Mormon literature that you're understanding who Elohim and Jehovah are because if you use today's understanding, it's not necessarily the understanding of that day because there was some modifying of who Elohim was and who Jehovah was in early Mormonism. So back to Nabu, um, Smith performs of the, in the upper room of, the existing. of his uh, storefront. Uh, well, and then of the, of the mm, Nauvoo, Temple. Nauvoo Temple, they do some in, the, in there. 
Um, he doesn't get too much of this temple ritual done with very many of the people before um, things go haywire and he ends up in uh, jail because of destroying a newspaper because it was exposing his polygamy. Uh, and he dies. And so then in 44. So then uh, they're still working on trying to finish the Nauvoo temple. And, um, and the ceremony's not even articulated on paper yet that we know of, right? No, that we know of. It wasn't written down. But he's instructed, supposedly, his top leaders in what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to be done. And so Brigham and the different church leaders then go to the top floor of the Nauvoo Temple to set it up uh, in a rough form how the ceremony should be done. And so they just use canvas to petition off in this huge big top floor of the temple, they just used canvases to curtain off certain designated areas for different rooms so that they can have symbolically this idea of moving from section to section as they eventually will do when they build the Salt Lake Temple and it has permanent rooms that the audience is going to move through for different parts of the ceremony. And then today's temple, they don't move, they sit in one auditorium and see a movie and, and uh, are told about the different things, but they don't actually move from room to room like that. Well, they move to a couple of rooms, but it's, it isn't as much movement as in the original. Uh, so they set it up in the Nauvoo uh, temple. And in 45 and 46, they have thousands of Mormons are taken through this makeshift temple ritual at the top of the Nauvoo temple to get as many endowed before they come west because they know once they leave that temple and come west, it'll be a while before they'll have another temple where they can do the ceremonies again. So they're trying to get everybody through they can. And uh, when they finally have to leave in 47 and come to Salt Lake, then they're, uh, I think... Uh, are, they doing, are they doing ceilings in the temple yet at that point? Uh, <coughs> Is it all outside the temple still, maybe? No, they're doing ten Mormon marriage ceremonies, yeah. But they don't have to be done. In, they didn't have to be done in a temple in Joseph Smith's day or in Nauvoo days. They could do marriage ceilings outside of the temple, too. Um, but they were trying to do them more in the temple. They didn't have, the ceilings didn't have to necessarily be done in there at that time. Then when they get out to Utah in a couple of years, they um, set up a a little temporary endowment house where they can go through the ritual for the people here and they use that little endowment house building until uh, well, what did it been? Well they spent a long Eight, time building the Salt Lake City. Yeah like 1887 or something that they were still using this endowment house I'm not sure of the year but I mean for years they used this endowment house while they were building the Salt Lake Temple and then um, word got out that the, the, the government had already started trying to prosecute the Mormons on polygamy and the word got out they were still doing some more plural marriages in the endowment house and so they tore the endowment house down and stopped doing endowments for a couple of years until they could finish the Salt Lake Temple. It's amazing how much connection the Mormon Temple has ultimately to polygamy. All right, the temple ritual to me is what started because of polygamy as an avenue for justifying polygamy, uh, for getting others to be involved in it as well, as so there becomes this a conglomerate of leadership that are all involved in secret ceremonies, temple ritual, the political kingdom of God. It all tied together as the restoration of the true church. You had to have true temple, true marriage, true government, true priesthood, and they all were bound as a unit um, because Jesus was coming back any day, and they, this was all necessary for the uh, end time scenario for Christ's return to have all of these things in place. Um, we did skip over real quickly here. The, when they're in um, Independence, Missouri, he expects to set up a temple there. Um, oh, yeah, he expected a couple of them. He was going to, yes, he gave a revelation that in this generation they were going to build a temple to Independence, Missouri because Christ was coming back and he would come back to Independence, Missouri. And then they got driven out, so that kind of scuttled that plan. 
Uh, then they went to Far West, and God said he was going to build a temple in the Far West, and that had to get uh, thrown out. And, of course, they did get the one built in Kirtland, but it didn't have the ritual that they have now uh, until finally they got the one in Nauvoo where they could do the full ritual. So, so the, if, if I could interrupt you, the, yeah. the, the, the presence of the temple in Nauvoo, or at least the building of it shortly there, the hope of having one in independence, and ultimately the building of one in Salt Lake, uh, very relevant to the gathering of the saints, to a yeah. centralization of the people of, of Zion. Right. At first, the gathering, all the Mormons were to gather to Independence, Missouri for the return of Christ. And then they were going to all gather uh, to Nauvoo, and then that didn't work out, and they moved west. So then they were all gathering to Salt Lake, and for years, Mormons were coming from all over for countries uh, all around the world, coming to Salt Lake for the gathering for the end time. And they expected at some point to march back to Independence and reclaim the land to set up the temple for Christ's final coming. And for years you'll find their sermons talking about, yes, we're still planning on going back to Independence. Yes, we're going to do that. Uh, around the turn of the century, uh, 1900, time frame, I don't remember what year, they quit preaching, gathering to a specific spot and started telling people to stay in the countries where they're at and that the gathering was wherever you are. You're gathering your country and don't gather to Salt Lake. And uh, that, so then they started building up a worldwide population of Mormons, but before they'd convert them and tell them all to immigrate and, and come to Salt Lake wow. or to Utah. And then they started telling them, no, stay put. <laughs> it's very, very interesting in light of today's boasting of, we have so many different members in other countries, whereas back then they... They all they, came here. They all wanted them here. Yes, uh, for the kingdom of God. And, and preparing for when they would march back to independence to set up their political kingdom of God for the ushering in of the millennium. So is it fair to say that Salt Lake Temple was sort of a, 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 a rallying point? Yes, immigrants? absolutely, yeah. Uh, it was the great temple. I mean, they had the St. George Temple before they got the Salt Lake one finished. But the Salt Lake one was the grand one. That was the one they were all looking forward to. And some of the accounts I've read, it talks about the, uh, the reason it took so long to finish the Salt Lake Temple was because they, some felt that, it, that Christ would come back before they finished the Salt Lake Temple. And so I think they were dragging their heels on finishing this because Joseph Smith at one time had predicted that uh, if he lived till uh, 1890, he would see the coming of Christ. So I think they're kind of dragging their heels, thinking, well, we don't want to finish this till Christ comes back, you know. And, and then finally, they, I think somebody realized, well, I don't think he's coming back tomorrow, so let's finish it off. Uh, 